Part 1 Red Harvest Geheimnistag nach Geheim early Erntezeit From the testimony of General Ludwig von Graal, unexpurgated text. It began in late summer. As the month of Vorgeheim drew to a close, a vast army of orcs and goblins emerged from the Middle Mountains. Sweeping past the network of forts and watchposts that guarded the frontier, the Greenskins pushed deep into northern Hochland. At their head was a new leader. Through a mixture of brutality and cunning, an orc chieftain called Morgoth Ironfang had managed to combine the fractious orc and goblin tribes of the Middle Mountains into an effective army. In time, it would become clear Ironfang was a far more able opponent than most of his human adversaries were inclined to credit, but for the moment that revelation still lay in the future. In the meantime, Ironfang's forces cut a destructive swathe through northern Hochland, destroying every settlement in their path. In Hergig, the first news of the invasion reached the Elector Count's court on the night of Geheimnistag, the so-called Day of Mystery, one of the most ominous dates in the imperial calendar. None dared say it aloud, but many at court wondered whether it was a sinister omen. Whatever the case, Count Aldebrand Ludenhoff of Hochland was not a man to be swayed by omens. Ordering that an army should be immediately dispatched to repel the invasion, Count Aldebrand made known his wish that the orc's chieftain's head be delivered to him, so he could mount it on a pike staff. Of course, it takes time to raise an army. Regiments need to be mustered, supplies have to be organized, and so on. Accordingly, several weeks passed before the Count's army took to the field, allowing the Greenskins time to push even deeper into Hochland. Soon, the roads from the north were crammed with refugees, while the sky was black with the smoke from burning villages. As for my own situation, at this moment of darkest crisis for my homeland, I found myself stalking the corridors of my summer house on the Talabek, condemned to the premature retirement that had been forced on me by my enemies at the elector's court. I have never been a political animal. Too much the old soldier to speak gladly to fools or play the dirty business of politics. Perhaps I was foolish in this. Certainly, at that moment, Finding I was forced to endure long days of enforced inactivity while the land I loved was in peril, I had reason to regret some of my past actions. But wishes are the same as the dedications on tombstones. Heartfelt they may be, but they can do little to change what has already been done. Naturally, I did my best to reverse my exile. From the instant I heard of the orc invasion, I fired off letters sent by messenger to the court and his staff, offering my service in whatever capacity was deemed necessary. The response was always the same. My pleas were returned with felicitations as to the state of my health, alongside assurances my services were no longer needed. I should enjoy my leisure, the messenger said. Let other men take up the strain of battle. I had earned my retirement for years of hard campaigning. It was time to let younger men put their shoulders to the stone. I recognized the sardonic handiwork of some of my rivals in these messages, in the way they said one thing while they meant another. Don't bother us, von Grawl, was the real message hidden between the lines. Your time is over, old man. Good riddance. We no longer need you. And so, while war raged through northern Hochland, while her people were slaughtered, I found there was nothing I could do. Of course, I followed the progress of the war as well as I could. Old habits die hard. In my study there was a full set of maps of Hochland and the surrounding provinces, left over from my campaigning days. As news, rumors, and reports came from the front, I made marks and annotations on my maps trying to make some sense of how the war was going. I was helped in this regard by the fact I still maintained some friends at court. There were a few old war horses like myself, still in positions of command, who had not as yet been put out to pasture. By drawing on these friendships, I was able to wheedle out the occasional piece of privileged information. 
I might be unable to have any effect on the campaign, but I was better informed than most. Not that it helped my mood, not any of it. In particular, I found myself concerned when I heard Count Aldebrand had decided to appoint General Eric von Nieder to command the campaign against the Greenskins. I knew von Nieder of old. The two of us had clashed many times over the years on matters of tactics, strategy, protocol, even coming close to fighting a duel once, many years ago. I had always regarded a man with disdain. To my mind, he was cast from the same mold as many of the toadies who spent their lives trying to gain influence at the elector's court. I viewed him as an arrogant blowhard who had risen to his office on the back of political maneuverings rather than through any real skill as a general. Unfortunately, no one was interested in my opinions on such matters. Forced to follow the progress of the war from afar, I could only hope von Nieder proved me wrong. With the future of Hochland at stake, I had to trust von Nieder's abilities and hope he could deal with the crisis. Otherwise, I feared the worst. Chapter 1 Dangers of the Road Make yourself comfortable, the car driver had told him once the money changed hands. We've a long journey northwards, and you might as well make the best of it. Three weeks later, as the cart jolted through the latest in a long series of potholes, Dieter Lanz remembered the words with a certain ill humor. Within a few hours of the journey beginning, Dieter had learned an important lesson of travel. There is no comfortable place in the back of a goods cart, much less in one piled high with supplies being transported to provision the army currently at camp in the northern forests. Granted, like the other carts in the caravan, there was a canvas covering over the back that shaded it from the elements, but it hardly outweighed its remaining effects. The roads the caravan had been following for the last three weeks were little more than a series of trails winding a roundabout path through the northern reaches of the great forest. The trails were not made for ease of travel, but weeks of heavy traffic had transformed them into a rutted, wheel-scarred obstacle course. The cart hit another pothole, forcing Dieter to catch a heavy salted ham to stop it falling on him. Placing the ham carefully to one side, he cast an exasperated glance at the uniformed soldier lying in the back of the wagon with him. Seemingly oblivious to the hardships of their journey, Hoist was asleep, snoring loudly, as he pillowed his head against the crate. Sigmar's beard, but your friend can sleep! The cart driver Otto called down to him from the front of the wagon. I've never seen the like. We've been on the road three weeks, and I swear he's been snoring for most of it. Dieter had no doubt about that. Having shared the back of the cart with Hoist ever since her gig, he had become unhappily accustomed to the other man's habits. Asleep, Hoist provided a one-man symphony of noises. Snores, groans, snorts, mutterings in his sleep, not to mention regular flatulent cannon bursts. So far, Hoist had spent all but a few hours of each day sleeping emerging from his bear-like state of hibernation only when food was in the offing. Still, it's a useful talent to have in the army, Otto continued, ignoring the trail ahead as he craned his neck around to look in the back of the wagon. You spend a lot of time on the road. Better just leave through it than be bored, I suppose. Sensing the driver was in a mood for conversation, and having had enough of Hoist's snoring to last him a lifetime, Dieter climbed over the partition separating the back of the cart from the front, and sat down next to Otto. The driver may have made him pay twelve shillings for the dubious luxury of riding in the back of the cart rather than walking, but Dieter held no particular grudge. The man was good company, and without his camaraderie, Dieter would have been condemned to spend the journey listening to Hoist's snores, wheezes, and farts toward their destination. Of course, it's better to sleep than to fight, Otto said, turning his eyes back on the road. No offense, my young friend, but I think you're mad. Imagine wanting to be a soldier, 
Never mind being so set on it, you're willing to travel from Hergig into these damned forests, chasing some pretty boy regiment of sword wavers in the hope they'll recruit you. Mad, that's what that is. But you're making the same journey, Dieter protested in good humor. In the last three weeks, he and Otto had argued the point several times. If I'm mad, what does that make you? Ah, oh, but I'm in it for profit, Otto said. Feeling in the back of the wagon, he brought up a half-empty bottle of wine and pulled out the stopper. It makes all the difference. You can keep all your talk of glory, honor, and the rest of that arse water. I'm a greedy man, and I don't mind who knows it. There's only one thing that would bring me this far north along these Sigmar Forsaken trails. It's silver. Gesturing with the bottle, Otto pointed to the long line of carts ahead of them. It's the same with all these others. Some are professional victuallers like me. Others are first-time men, amateurs. The war brings them out. It gets so anyone with a cart thinks they only have to fill it with provisions and take it north to be rolling in coin like a pig in fresh manure. I wouldn't have thought there'd be that much money in supplying soldiers, Dieter said to him. No? Well, you'd be wrong there. The army quartermasters will pay a fine penny for every scrap of food they can get their hands on. Never mind what the troops themselves will pay for drink, black snuff, and any other luxuries a man can manage to take with him. Otto took a long draught from the wine bottle before continuing. You see, this is the best time to be victualling, early in the campaign when the supply lines are still not properly sorted. I hear the count called up twenty thousand men. That's a lot of hungry mouths. And the generals and quartermasters know if they don't see to feeding them, the men will desert. There's lots of armies end their days like that, not killed by the enemy or even by disease. They just melt away through lack of supplies. But if that's true, there's more at stake here than just money, Dieter said appalled. The rumors say there's a horde of orcs ready to come sweeping down through northern Hochland. Surely it's your duty to help the army, not make a profit from them. <laughs> duty? Otto spat a mouthful of phlegm, tinged pink from wine. That's another one of those arse-water words like glory and honor. I have a wife and family. Duty won't put bread on their table, nor replace me if I get killed by the orcs. Silver, Dieter, and gold, they're the only things with real value in life. Everything else is big shit. But what about Hochland? If the rumors are true, the entire province could be in danger. Rah! Snorting in contempt, Otto took another pull from the bottle. You're young, my friend. That's the problem. When you get older, you'll realize these things are not uncommon occurrences. The orcs are always invading. Or if it's not them, it's the Ostlanders, or the undead, or the followers of the ruinous powers. Still gripping the bottle tightly in one hand, Otto made the sign of the hammer. Someone is always trying to kill us here in the Empire. We are surrounded by enemies. War is the natural order of things. After a while, you realize it's better not to think of it. If you dwell on these things too much, you'd never get a good night's sleep. Not like your friend there. Now there's a man who knows how to avoid his cares. Jerking a thumb behind him, Otto indicated Hoist, still asleep in the back of the cart. A sack of flour perched on a stack of crates beside him had developed a small tear at a corner, dribbling white dust into Hoist's face. Even that was not enough to wake him. Sniffing in unconscious irritation, Hoist blew out from under his lips and turned on the side. Not for the first time since they had met, Dieter found himself staring at Hoist intently. The soldier was a large man, with a bearish build and a broad tanned face distinguished by an impressive bushy mustache. When he wasn't snoring like a sleeping milch cow, Dieter had found him to be a boisterous, personable fellow, much given to loud opinions and expansive gestures. They had met in Hergig, at the barracks of the third Hochland swordsman. 
The third was a famous regiment, nicknamed the Grey and Scarlets, or simply the Scarlets for short. The men of the third wore a distinctive uniform that set them apart from the other Hochland regiments. Hoist was wearing the uniform now, a grey doublet, scarlet undershirt, hose that they were grey on one leg and red on the other. There were slashes in the fabric of the doublet, running along both arms and down either side of the torso, which allowed the colors of the undershirt to peek through, creating an effect eerily reminiscent of bloody wounds, as though the wearer had suffered injury in battle. As well as the uniform, Hoist wore a steel breastplate and an open helmet, topped with a feather dyed red and green, the state colors of Hochland. Taken together, the effect should have been impressive. Certainly it set Hoist apart from the other soldiers they had met on the road, most of whose uniforms followed drab variations on the more typical Hochland color scheme of red and green. Hoist had told Dieter his story soon after the pair had met. He was a member of the Scarlets, but he had been wounded in a tavern skirmish some weeks back with the soldiers of a rival regiment. Although his injuries were now healed, they had caused him to arrive too late to join the muster when the regiment had been sent north. Since Hoist was eager to rejoin his comrades, he and Dieter had agreed to travel north together. It had been Hoist's idea to bribe one of the victuallers to take them in his wagon rather than walking. Although in a development that Dieter now recognized as part of a pattern, Hoist had persuaded him to pay the entire bribe himself, citing his recent medical expenses as the reason for his lack of coin. Dieter had dreamed of joining the Scarlets almost since he was a child, but he was finding it hard to marry his inner ideal of the regiment with the representative example currently taking up valuable space in the back of the wagon. Hoist was not what he had expected. Dieter supposed he had come to regard the Scarlets as heroes. There seemed little that could be called heroic, however, in a sleeping, farting oaf with a face covered in flour. Soldiering isn't all it's cracked up to be, Otto said, as though divining Dieter's thoughts. Nor are the soldiers, for that matter. Don't get me wrong, it's a useful skill knowing how to kill. Valuable, even. But then, that's the problem with soldiers. They sell their skills for a few pennies, when any sensible man would realize there's better ways to make money from your sword arm. The forest was surprisingly quiet. Dieter had grown up in the country, in an old mill on the outskirts of a small village. He was accustomed to the sounds of nature, the call of birds, wild animal cries, and the howl of wolves. This far into the woods, he would have expected more noise, a forest cacophony. Thinking about it, he realized that the creatures of the deep woods were unused to the presence of human beings, much less a caravan of rattling, noisy carts. For all that, the forest seemed quieter than was normal. Abruptly, Dieter realized the woods were all but silent. There were no sounds from among the trees, not even the distant murmur of birds. It was unsettling. He could only hear the noises of the caravan and the gentle whisper of the wind through the leaves of the trees. You understand what I'm getting at? Otto said, offering him the wine bottle. I've seen you practicing your fencing with the caravan guards. You're good, Dieter. Too good to be wasting your talents on soldiering. You'd make a damn sight more money by joining my operation. Victualing's a hard trade. There's always some bastard looking to steal your gold or pilfer goods from the cart. Then there's always the dangers of the road to contend with. Bandits, highwaymen, deserters, beastmen and the like. A man can be a lot surer of his profits if he's got someone with a good sword arm standing beside him. I can pay you a shilling a day and cut you in for one-tenth of the profits, minus expenses, of course. Added to which, naturally, I'll teach you to trade. Well, what do you say? They were his last words. Suddenly, a massive spear flew from the forest and embedded itself in Otto's chest, pinning him to the cart like a butterfly stuck to its mount. The wine bottle fell from Otto's dead hand and smashed to the ground. 
Unsheathing the sword at his side, Dieter turned as a chorus of bestial roars came from either side of the trail. He saw horned, goat-legged creatures appear from among the trees to attack the line of carts. Recognizing them as beastmen, he grabbed his shield from the back of the wagon, casting an eye at hoist under the canvas. The swordsman had begun to stir, his slumber rudely interrupted by the tumult of screams and shouts as the caravan came under attack. The air was suddenly filled with the sounds of battle. The yells and alarms of the guards, beastmen battle cries and the shrieks of panicking animals. Hoist! Dieter yelled at the sleeping soldier. Get up, damn it! We're being attacked! He kicked a small cask toward the man, hoping the impact would rouse him. Unperturbed, Hoist grumbled in his sleep and turned over onto his side. Glancing back outside, Dieter saw dark figures moving toward the cart. The time when he could afford to waste precious seconds trying to wake Hoist was past. Jumping down from the cart, Dieter hefted his shield and made ready to meet the beastman's attack. There were three of them. Each one stood at a little less than Dieter's height. They were armed with spears. In place of horns, their heads were crowned with stubby knobs, like the seed horns of an immature stag. Dieter recognized them as the lesser breed of beastmen, reportedly less dangerous than their bigger horned brethren. Still, lesser breed or not, they had him outnumbered. The first one charged him, a little ahead of the others. Dieter met its spear thrust with his shield, deflecting the blow downward and to the left, as he had been taught. At the same time, he slashed out with his sword, catching the creature at the side of the temple with a blow that split its head open. With a scream, the beastman fell. The two others were more cautious. Instead of charging him headlong, they kept their distance. Making use of the superior reach of their spears over his sword, they jabbed at Dieter, one trying to hold his attention, while its brother beast tried to get behind him. Wise to the trick, Dieter took the offensive. Charging to the nearest beastman, he met its spear jab with his shield and pushed into it, forcing the creature to stumble backwards as it tried to prevent the spear being jarred out of its grip. The beastman slipped. Taking advantage of his enemy's momentary confusion, Dieter stabbed low with his sword, catching the beast in the side as it fell. In the meantime, the third beastman had charged towards him. Whirling away from its fallen brother, Dieter parried a spear thrust with his sword, relying on his attacker's momentum to bring them into close quarters. For a moment, as the beastman struggled to unlock the haft of its spear from the crossguard of Dieter's sword, they were face to face. Up close, the monster was repugnant. It leered at him in bloodlust, eyes staring at him in hatred. There was a sickening smell about it the musk of a herd animal mixed with the charnel stench of blood. With his free hand, Dieter smashed his shield into its face. Snout bloodied, the beastman lost its grip on its spear, allowing Dieter to hook his blade underneath and stab upwards, burying a good length of empire-forged steel into the thing's heart. He had no time to celebrate his victory. Whichever way he looked, Dieter saw men and beastmen locked in life-or-death confrontation as the caravan guards and their drivers did their best to hold their own against the beastmen raiders. Ahead, he could see some of the carts had been dragged to the edge of the trail and overturned onto their sides, though he could not be sure whether these were the work of the caravan's defenders or accidents caused by draught animals that had panicked at the beastmen's attack. Similarly, from Dieter's vantage, it was impossible to tell which side was winning. It was clear the outcome of the battle could still swing either way. Intending to add his own efforts to the caravan's defense, Dieter looked about him in search of any defender nearby who might need his help. Before he could make his decision, however, he heard a deafening, bleating roar behind him. It held a definite note of challenge. Turning, he saw an enormous beastman moving toward him. It was a gore the larger of the beastman breeds. This one stood nearly one and a half times as tall as Dieter, not counting its horns, which spread wide from its head and curled back on themselves like the horns of a goat. 
In the 18 years of his life to date, Dieter had experienced the misfortune of meeting with Beastmen on several occasions. Given the size of the creature currently bearing down on him, he judged it must be a leader among its kind, not a chieftain perhaps, but certainly some kind of champion or favored warrior. It reminded him of the bloodthirsty beast spoken of in the tale of Thomas Wanderer, the gallanting Nacht, whose death was commemorated in a nursery rhyme told to the Empire's children. The monster was covered in scars, some evidently gained in battle, others self-inflicted and shaped in the manners of sigils, as though the beast had carved and branded some prayer to its heathen gods into its living flesh. Dozens of trophies dangled on leather cords from its body. Teeth, claws, fingers, bones, even severed heads, taken from a variety of prey, including humans. The beastman roared again. It lowered its axe and shield, leaving its chest unguarded as though daring Dieter to strike it. Dieter could not be sure, but he thought the beast was smiling. The creature rasped, its voice sounding frighteningly human for something so clearly not. Dieter could not be sure whether it was the creature's name, a challenge ritual, or even some form of beastman oath. He was not entirely certain whether the noises the monster was making were even words. Raising its axe, the monster stormed towards him with surprising swiftness. Dieter barely had time to prepare his shield before the blow was struck. He did not meet it directly, instead slanting the shield sideways at an angle to deflect the blow and channel its force away from him. Even so, his shield was split in two. Dieter felt the axe blade whisper past his skin as it cut through the arm straps and dragged the broken pieces of the shield away. An inch or two closer, and it would have cut through the flesh of his arm like a butcher's cleaver. The beastman attacked once more, swinging its axe on the backstroke as it came at him remorselessly. Dieter jumped backward just in time to avoid the blow. Dodging to one side as the creature swung the axe again, he tried to stop himself being pushed back against the cart. It was hopeless. The monster was relentless. It was all Dieter could do to stay clear of the blade. The axe strokes came too quickly to allow him to escape. He had managed to steer away from the cart itself, but instead his retreat had pushed him toward the dray team hitched in front of it. From the corner of his eye he could see the horses fidgeting, frightened by the violence going on around them. So far, only the narrowness of the trail and the fact that there was another cart parked directly in front of them had stopped them from bolting. If the beastman forced him back any closer to them, the animals would panic. Squeezed between them and the advancing beastman, it was a question of whether Dieter would have his head whipped from his shoulders by an axe or have his skull split by a kicking hoof. As matters stood, he had precious few other choices. Hoist! Dieter called out, hoping to at last rouse the sleeping man in the cart. Help me! I need you, damn it! His words brought no response. Risking a quick glance to see if there was anyone else nearby who might help him, Dieter was disappointed to find there was no one else close enough for him to call to. All along the trail, dozens of men were engaged in their own individual battles, each too busy trying to survive to help or even notice him. To Dieter it felt like he might as well have been the last man in the world. In the middle of battle, surrounded by bloodshed, he had never felt so alone. Desperately, Dieter took a gamble. Trying to read the rhythm of the beastman's attacks, he timed it to the gap between axe strokes and leapt forward, thrusting his sword out with all his strength. Making a target of the creature's throat, he thrust diagonally upward, praying the unexpectedness of the attack would give him an opening. It worked. The beastman tried to defend itself with its shield, but before it could close the gap, Dieter's sword struck home. The blade stabbed through the bottom of the monster's chin, spearing up through the tongue and palate into the brain. Briefly, the beastman stood transfixed, a look less of pain than of surprise on its face. The eyes went blank. Like a puppet cut free of its strings, the monster collapsed, pulling Dieter's sword after it. 
feeling naked without his blade, Dieter bent forward and tried to remove his sword from the dead beast man. It was wedged fast. Afraid the blade might snap if he tugged too violently, Dieter wriggled it from side to side, trying to work the weapon free. Suddenly he heard another roar, close at hand. Looking up, he saw a second gore emerge from the forest and start to stride purposefully down the trail toward him. It was even more monstrous than the first, its mutated body bearing a third arm jutting freakishly from the top of its shoulder as a sign of some dark god's favor. Two of the creature's hands held axes, the third a spear. As it moved closer, it opened its mouth, uncoiling a length of barbed leprous tongue, dripping poison like the tail of some hellish insect. Despairing of freeing his sword in time, Dieter pulled a knife from his belt and backed away. Compared to the beastman's arsenal, it seemed a pitiful weapon. A single-edged blade with a cloth-bound handle, made more for skinning rabbits and cutting twine than killing enemies. It was all he had. Hoist! Dieter called out again, more in hope than expectation. Where are you? I need help! Careful to keep one eye on the approaching monster, Dieter cast about for a better weapon. His gaze alighted on the axe belonging to the gore he had just killed. It was a massive thing with a broad, heavy blade. A two-handed weapon by human standards, although the beastman had wielded it in one. Dieter had never wielded an axe against anything more dangerous than a tree trunk, but it had to give him a better chance than the knife. The beastman came closer. Making a show of its dexterity, it simultaneously tossed its two axes from one hand to the other, so they crossed past each other in flight. The monster seemed to be taunting him, daring him to make a dive for the weapon of its comrade. The fallen axe was barely a few feet away, agonizingly close. Calculating the odds, Dieter decided his only chance was to leave it to the last possible instant, dive for the axe and hope for the best. The beastman extended its tongue further. Glistening with venom, the appendage whipped and snapped in the air as though it had a mind of its own. Dieter felt like a rabbit watching the dance of a snake, waiting for the strike. Abruptly the tongue stiffened. It shot back into the beastman's mouth as the creature opened its jaws wide and screamed in pain. To Dieter's surprise, the monster's weapons dropped from nerveless hands. It fell to its knees, eyes wondering how it could have been brought so low. It pitched forward, face down into the dirt. Well, are you going to get your sword? There's plenty more where those came from. It was hoist. He was standing behind the fallen beastman, its blood fresh on the blade of his sword. With the layer of white flour dusted over Hoist's face, he looked faintly ridiculous, although at that moment Dieter was overjoyed to see him, no matter what he looked like. Scrambling to follow Hoist's advice, Dieter hurried to get his sword. Having retrieved it, he found Hoist following close behind him. We'll make a stand here, Hoist said. Some of the guards seem to be making a good fist of fighting off the beastmen near the head of the caravan, but we're too far away from them to get there. They'd run us down before we took a dozen steps. As Hoist talked, Dieter became uncomfortably aware of movement in the trees nearby. Something was watching them. You see them? Hoist asked, spotting the direction of his gaze. A beast heard. They held back to let their champions have a go at you. I take it those three dead angors are yours as well? That piece of work is probably what attracted the champions' attention. Anyway, now they're dead. The rest of the herd won't mess about. There will be no more single combat. They'll rush us in one mass, try to take us through weight of numbers. The movement intensified. Dieter saw a number of beastmen emerge from among the trees. They were of the smaller kind, the ones Hoist called Angors. Watching the enemy gather, Dieter was struck by how much he and Hoist were outnumbered. We fight back to back, Hoist told him. That way we cover each other. I've seen your sword work, lad, and it's fine. But this isn't the time for fancy moves. This is war, not fencing. A beast comes at you, you kill it. 
You keep things hard, fast and simple. You don't worry about the next one or the one after that. They'll come at you in their own good time and you'll get to them. You understand me? I understand, Dieter answered. Right then, let's get to business. Turning his back so he and Dieter faced in opposite directions, Hoist called out in a loud voice to the beastmen. What are you waiting for, you bastards? We killed your champions. Come and get what they got. The enemy hardly seemed to need the encouragement. Having gathered their forces in sufficient quantity to counteract, the nervousness they felt at facing the men who had defeated their champions, the beastmen charged towards Dieter and Hoist. In the long seconds as they waited for the Angors to reach them, Dieter felt a queasy feeling in the pit of his stomach. He counted more than a dozen of the enemy, even as yet more Angors emerged from the forest to join the attack. Looking from face to face of the creatures, charging towards him, Dieter saw a succession of features all set in the same general lines of savagery, rage and hate. He wondered how he and Hoist could ever hope to hold them back. Then the enemy was upon them, and the time for misgivings was past. As before, one beastman ran ahead of its fellows, more eager for the kill. Dieter met it with cold steel, deflecting its spear thrust with his open hand as he jabbed the point of his blade deep into the chest. The next beastman followed hot on the heels of the first. Dieter parried its attack with his sword, responding with a swift repost that left the enemy clutching a wound in its throat. The third one Dieter unbalanced with a skillful feint, before disemboweling it with a flash of his blade. He snatched the dying beastman's shield as it fell, experimentally testing its weight as he prepared to face the next opponent. Don't get cocky, Hoist growled from behind him. Keep it simple. In battle, Hoist was a revelation. For weeks, Dieter had only known him as his snoring companion on the dull journey northward. Now, in his element, Hoist was like a tiger. Where Dieter was a fencer, Hoist was a street fighter. He made war a matter of brutal practicality. He fought with sword, shield, elbow and knees. Dieter didn't doubt the older man would be willing to use his teeth if that was what it took. From the corner of his vision, he saw Hoist headbutt an angor, striking with the brow of his helmet to smash the creature between the eyes. As that beastman fell, he lashed out at another, striking with his shield rim at its throat, before finishing it with a quick stab of his sword. In his own way, he was as relentless and purposeful as any back-alley brawler. He made sure when he hit someone, they did not get back up. Despite the two men's best efforts, the position was hopeless. Even as he dispatched another beastman with a thrust of his sword, Dieter realized they were only delaying the inevitable. There were too many beastmen. For every one they killed, another moved forward to take its place. Already he and Hoist were being hemmed in, forced to fight in the ever-decreasing space afforded by the press of beastmen around them. Soon they would be overwhelmed. Relief, when it came, was sudden and unexpected. Dieter heard a voice cry out, Forward! Forward the third! Forward for Hochland! A trumpet sounded nearby, signaling a charge. Other voices joined it. Almost before Dieter could work out what was happening, the mass of beastmen around them dissipated as the creatures fled. He saw a group of swordsmen come charging from the forest, clad in the same grey and red uniforms as Hoist. Dieter's heart caught in his mouth as he realized their identity. They were the Scarlets. Seeing them in the flesh brought to mind the childish dreams of his younger years, when he had idled his days at the mill, looking forward to the time when he would come of age and could become a soldier. The Scarlets attacked with controlled ferocity, cutting through the beastmen like a scythe. As they swept the enemy before them, Dieter heard the same battle cry repeated, taken up by the chorus of dozens of voices. Forward the third! Forward for Hochland! Before he knew what was doing, he had taken up the cry himself. With Hoist beside him, Dieter joined the Scarlets in pursuing the fleeing beastmen. The finesse he had used earlier in fighting the enemy was gone. 
Caught up in the moment, he lashed out at the beastmen as they ran. With the battle turned in the caravan's favor, he was eager for vengeance. He fought without thought or strategy or tactics. His sword rose and fell, lost in a haze of blood. Too soon, there were no more enemies left to fight. As the last of the beastmen fled from the trail into the forest, Dieter made to follow them. Hoist stopped him. The big man stepped in front of Dieter, sword sheathed, and his hand held out in a warning gesture. Leave them. We'd be fools to chase them through the forest, and the beastmen know it. The woods are theirs. Anyway, they've been put to flight. It's over, lad. Cool your fires. Coming back to his senses, Dieter realized he was breathing heavily. Sheaving his own sword, he glanced down at the thick wooden shield he had taken from one of the dead beastmen. In the aftermath of battle, it seemed an unclean thing, carved with strange and sickening runes. He threw it away. Wiping at the sweat staining his face, he turned to inspect the men and carts of the caravan. It was difficult to judge where he was standing, but he gathered more had survived than he would have expected. He supposed the victuallers and their guards were hardy men, accustomed to the threat of ambush on lonely roads. He looked towards the cart where he and Hoist had been riding. Otto was still in the same place, pinned to his seat, the haft of the beastman's spear jutting from his chest. Why, it's a shame, Hoist said, following the direction of Dieter's gaze. He seemed an all right sort, but that's war for you. You never know when you're gonna get it. All you can hope is that your comrades give you a good send-off. With that in mind... Having apparently decided a suitable period of mourning had passed, Hoist began to move toward the cart. You have to be sharp about these things, he called over his shoulder. If we wait too long, the other victuallers will have picked the cart clean. Otto had some good wine and food, and besides, I'm sure it's what he would have wanted. Vaguely appalled at the other man's behavior, even though he could recognize its practical bent, Dieter watched as Hoist jumped into the back of the cart and disappeared under the canvas as he started tossing out items. Soon, a heap of provisions lay on the ground. You there, a voice called out from behind Dieter. Don't you know that looting is a crime? Personally, I'd say it's only a crime if you get caught, Hoist replied, smiling as his face peeked out, still covered in flour from under the canvas. And that's hardly likely with useless bastards like you serving as sentries. Is that right? the voice asked. Well, in that case, I have an observation. You, sir are a damnable pox-ridden cur. Your mother, assuming any woman would admit to that offense, was a harlot with carnal knowledge of every dung-seller, rat-catcher, and body-snatcher in the greater Hergig area. Also, your face appeared to be covered with a light dusting of flour, making you appear even more of an idiot than you already are. I call you out, as does my colleague. Turning, Dieter saw two soldiers approaching in the uniform of the Scarlets. The first, evidently the one who had spoken, was a dark-haired man of medium height, with a hawkish nose and quick grey eyes. His blond-haired comrade was taller and thinner, with an ascetic, intense air about him that seemed to sit uneasily with his profession. If it were not for his uniform, Dieter might have taken the second man for a scribe or a priest. "'Call me out, you say?' Hoist jumped out of the wagon, landing beside his pile of stolen goods. The two of you, I accept the challenge. Do you want me to fight both at once or one after the other? Frankly, given the fact that you two look like a pair of puss dribbling simpletons, I can't imagine it would make any difference. His grin widening, Hoist advanced and embraced the two men, first one and then the other. Gerhard, Rieger! It's good to see you. So the orcs haven't killed you? What news of the war? Slow going, the dark man shrugged. We haven't seen any greenskins yet, though if you only listen to rumors, they've been laying waste to settlements all across the frontier. 
So far, the only action we've seen is against beastmen like the ones that attacked your caravan. Naturally, of course, that's all because of the orcs. How could that be? Dieter asked him. Beastmen and orcs don't work together. He regretted speaking almost immediately. Until then, the two new arrivals had ignored him, but now they turned to regard him with dispassionate eyes. Although he did his best to maintain his composure, Dieter felt distinctly uneasy under their scrutiny. Who is this? the dark one asked Hoist. It's not like you to pick up waifs and strays on the road, Hoist. Not unless they're female, the blond man offered, speaking for the first time. Indeed, the dark man nodded. His eyes narrowed as he stared at Dieter. What about it, boy? You've got the bright-eyed, eager look of a would-be recruit about you. Have you come to make war on Hochland's enemies? Or are you just lost in the woods like the rest of us? My name is Dieter Lands, Dieter said, refusing to be intimidated. I have come to join the Scarlets. Really? The dark man turned away to look at Hoist. Where'd you find him? Is he some illegitimate son that you fathered on a doxy, come to track you down? Or a creditor, perhaps? There's a few of them who'd be willing to follow you all the way to the chaos waste, if they'd thought it'd make you pay what you owe. Certainly he can't be a soldier. Oh, leave the lad alone, Gerhard, Hoist said. He did all right. Granted, he asks stupid questions, but he pretty much does what you tell him. And he's a dab hand with a sword. In that case, he'd better come with us. The dark-haired one, Gerhard, turned toward Dieter. To answer your question, the orc advance has forced some of the beastman tribes to flee their territory like animals running from a forest fire. That's why these beastmen here attack your caravan. The orcs have driven them away from their usual hunting ground, so they're hungry. Any more questions? Uh, no. Dieter found himself almost squirming at the intensity of the other man's gaze. At the same time, he wondered at the ferocity of the orcs, that they could send terrifying monsters like the beastmen scurrying before them like frightened rats. Good. Gerhard turned away. Well, come on then, we haven't got all day. We will escort this caravan back to our encampment, then you can see Captain Harkner, our regimental commander. If you want to be a scarlet boy, he's the man you need to impress. <laughs>